Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. So welcome to our Ward 1 City Council Candidate Forum. My name is Max Sanders, and I will be your moderator this evening. Today's forum is sponsored by the League of Women Voters of St. Paul and is in partnership with the St. Paul Neighborhood Network, Union Park District Council, Frogtown Neighborhood Association, North End Neighborhood Association, Summit Avenue, Summit University Planning Council, the NAACP St. Paul, IATA Leeds, and Sustain St. Paul. The League of Women Voters St. Paul conducts, conducts candidate forums to provide the public with an opportunity to hear candidates discuss the issues that are important to members of the public. The League is a nonpartisan organization that does not support or oppose any political party or candidate. The views expressed in each forum are those of the candidates, not those of the League of Women Voters. The League of Women Voters Minnesota and our local leagues post complete, unedited recordings of forums. Editing is authorized only for official media reporting. Excerpts or edited clips of candidate forums may not be used for partisan or political purposes. We ask that members of the audience refrain from recording or taking pictures tonight. Again, we will post a full unedited, unedited recording of tonight's forum on the SPNN YouTube page. We believe the success of our city depends on the values, knowledge, and commitment of our elected officials. Thus, it's essential for the public to better understand the views, opinions, and commitments of people running for elected office. It is this understanding that better equips voters with information to make informed voting decisions. We appreciate the candidates and the audience for taking the time to be with us tonight. As mentioned, today's forum is for the candidates running for office of Ward 1 City Council. Uh, I'd like to welcome Omar Syed, Suze Worley, Anika Bowie, James Lowe, Yen Chen, Travis Hellkamp, and Jeff Seitler. The candidates participating in today's forum have all agreed to the forum rules, which were included in the invitation to participate. Uh, Barb is going to raise, as an example, our 30-second card. So when you see Barb hold up that card, that means we have 30 seconds. And then when he, she holds up that red card, it means we need to stop. So each candidate will give a two-minute introductory statement, and then candidates will, candidates will have one minute to answer questions and 30 seconds for a rebuttal. When do you get a rebuttal? I'm glad you asked. Candidates may only take a rebuttal if they're mentioned by another candidate. We will accept written questions throughout the forum. Uh, you, may, you may have seen note cards on your chairs. If you have a question you want to ask, just raise your card up, and Amy or Donna will come by and pick it up. Questions that are of a personal nature, embarrassing, hostile, or unclear in intent will not be asked. Similar questions may be consolidated, and questions may be edited for clarity or brevity. Campaign literature, buttons, signs, clothing, or any other campaign-related items are not allowed in the room, but information on candidates is available on the tables outside the room. Please remain as quiet as possible so that everyone may hear. Please hold your applause until the forum has ended so that candidates will have as much time as possible to answer your questions, and please place your cell phones on silent. Members of the media may be recording this forum for their own use, and as mentioned, the forum is being recorded by the St. Paul Neighborhood Network for viewing by the public. With that, we will begin with opening statements. As a reminder, candidates will each have two minutes, and we are going to start on my far end with Jeff. All right. Usually, uh, I'm the last person to speak because my last name starts with Z, so thank you for starting at the end today. My name is Jeff Zeitler. I'm running for city council, and this is my first time running for anything in St. Paul or anywhere for that matter. I've been flyering with my wife, Gita, for the last week or so all around the neighborhood. Our goal is to walk every street in Ward 1 before we finish, uh, before November 7th, hopefully well before November 7th. I've been asked many times to describe, well, what party are you with? And I have to say, I'm not with any of them. I'm an independent, and I'm proud to be an independent. Uh, if I have to give an elevator speech, I would say I am socially liberal and fiscally conservative, and only fiscally conservative because I see St. Paul running into some issues you know, with high, high taxes and the inability to plow our streets, fill our potholes, or provide police services. Um, I think I'll just leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. We're gonna go next to Suze. Good evening. Uh, thank you all for being here, and thank you for, to the organizers. Uh, my name is Suze Worley. I live in Ward 1 in Crocus Hill. And I am very excited about the kinds of improvements we can make to St. Paul uh, to make it more accessible for people with disabilities and much safer for people who use uh, non-car transport. 
I'm going to use a brief anecdote about my father because he nicely encap encapsulates what I hope to accomplish in St. Paul. My father had to move from St. Paul to Roseville because he said I could not deal with another St. Paul winter without plowed streets. He's 70 and he's in very good physical condition, but he just couldn't do it anymore. Um, he was also hit while riding on his bicycle down Energy Park Drive because there was no bike lane and a woman just ran right into him. She didn't even see him. And to me, that really drives home what I'm, what I'm looking for, is just to create safer cycling infrastructure and, you know, plowed roads, and hopefully plowed sidewalks as well, but let's not get crazy. Um, I want to make the city a better place for my dad and people like my dad who, you know, maybe could just need, they just need a little bit of help. Like, they, they don't want to be shut in their houses. They don't want to be stuck inside because they can't get around. Um, so yeah, that's basically what I'm, what I'm looking to do. Thanks. Thank you, Suze. Omar? Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight here in uh, um, on, uh, our uh, forum here in, uh, uh, inside the World One. And I, I also thank you for uh, League of Women that organizing here tonight in uh, this forum. Thank you. Uh, my name is Omar Sayed. I am a candidate city council here in Ward 1. Uh, I am a, a husband, I am a father, I am a small business owner. I am also a city planning commission. I am a vice chair of a zoning city of St. Paul. Uh, one thing I'm here tonight and, and to emphasize uh, my vision is I want to see here in Ward 1 to build uh, affordable housing. Uh, I know a war one is, is a diverse community and also a low income com uh, community. And we all uh, demand, um, most of them depend on uh, uh, low income uh, and, and, and low uh, or, affor or uh, a affordable housing. And I've been in the planning commission a while and I vote a lot of affordable housing, in, especially in St. Paul, whether uh, uh, a affordable housing or uh, um, uh, off market, and uh, you can see most uh, some of the construction going on in, in War One, especially one in uh, right in here in Milton and, and Selby. That's affordable housing that I voted. And uh, um, on the other side, the other one is, is in Greekson University. So that's the reason that we're here tonight to emphasize my vision. And thank you for. Thank you, Omar James. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to thank our moderator, uh, League of Women um, Voter, and all you guys for being here. My heart is full because look at this. This is a full room. This is what a community looks like. So thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, to understand myself a little bit, my story started back in Thailand, Southeast Asia. I was not born here. By being born in Southeast Asia, uh, we came here because of the war, and we settled here in 1994, about 29 years ago. Uh, so actually, this month will be 30 years. So we lived here in the Frogtown neighborhood, you know, not knowing a lick of English. Navigating the system here in St. Paul was very difficult. You know, if you look at the data, I was not supposed to be here in front of you all today. But through hard work, through determination, through our educational system, I made it. I went to college, and I'm the first of my family to earn a college education. And my story is a story of, like you are, perseverance. Be able to work hard and make it through the system. So my piece, even though now as a counselor working here in St. Paul, grew up here in St. Paul, I see a lot of struggle with our family. Parents still working two jobs. The safety issue, the property tax, the city services, there's a lot of things that we need to do at the city level. That's why I decided to run. As a father of seven kids, my wife and I, I don't know what we were thinking, right? But most importantly, we by blessing, we have seven kids and I'm running to make St. Paul better, to be your voice at City Hall, because right now, City Hall and St. Paul are not listening to you all and to us to make our city better. So thank you, and I'm honored to be here. Thank you, James. Travis? Thank you for having me. Um, this is a great event for the city, and it's really nice to see this beautiful audience. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I was born and raised in this city, so I'm very familiar with it. I love it very much. It's, it's a quiet gem. I think St. Paul has always had a reputation of being a quiet, kind of a small town feel. 
And one of the reasons I'm running is because I feel like we are losing that more and more. Um, I have been to a lot of big cities as well. I've traveled all over this country. And one of the things that we are seeing happen everywhere is crime is on the rise. Fentanyl is being abused everywhere. If you ride the light rail in the city, it is disgusting. And that is not a joke. And that is squarely on the shoulders of City Hall right now and the state government. Why are we incapable of having safe streets, clean streets, well-maintained streets, well-plowed streets? We are capable of all these things and within a reasonable budget. We don't need to raise taxes insanely to do it. We need to bring sensible government back to St. Paul. We need law and order on the streets, and we need to support our businesses. We need to bring businesses back to the city, and we need to main, retain the great businesses that we have. That's why I'm running. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Travis. Yen? Thank you. My name is Yen Chen. I was born in Shanghai, China. I came to America as, um, on a student visa when I was 19 years old. Living in China at that time, uh, life was simple and uh, did not prepare me to be a foreign student uh, in America. I had to pay out-of-state tuition, living expense, rent, take as many courses as I could, work to support myself uh, while learning to speak in English. In order to deal with all this responsibility, I decided to do something a student should never do in science. I started to learn by taking tests, rather than instead of learning to understand it. Of course, when my life stabilizes, I have to close a lot of that knowledge gap by learning the concept again. I guess that was the first time I had to solve a problem complex in nature for a 19 years old me. Under financial stress, I had to learn to set a priority, did the best I could without delaying going to graduate school. Once in graduate school, I realized I might be a slow book learner, but actually I'm a good experimentalist. I enjoy problem solving which is uh, experimental science all about. I had a great time in science because the science I did really taught me what it mean by a sustainable organization when nature designs it. Two years ago, when I experienced how crime can infect a neighborhood, I decided to run for city council position to reducing crime for the neighborhood. I'm hoping I can demonstrate to you it is possible to solve problems in our community by few modifications uh, without the change what you love about the sample. Thank you, Yen. Anika? Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I just want to say it's an honor that you all chose to be here today. You could have been anywhere, but you chose to be here because you're really concerned, um, right, about who's going to be the next leader, who's going to be representing us on the city council. My name is Anika Bowie, and I come to the city council seat with about 15 years of experience in public policy advocacy. In 2018, I served as one of the youngest vice presidents for the Minneapolis NAACP and withstand the storm where when Minnesota was the eye of the storm, withstand all of the crisis, the challenges that we went through. I have demonstrated um, through my experience a strong, deep level of commitment to people in solving problems. I've done that through uh, my organizing through Restore the Vote, leading the Restore the Vote Minnesota Coalition to where this year we were able to ensure that over 50,000 people had access to the ballot, had access to democracy. Um, those are really tough challenges to get through, right? Uh, Ward 1 needs someone who's going to be courageous. Um, many of our challenges are very complex, are unique. 
Um, you can see here right now, we have a total of eight people running for Ward 1. So it shows our enriched diversity in culture. Um, I am someone who is committed to building a coalition that is going to include everyone. I'm also running not to only be one vo voice on the city council, but to ensure that you have access to serve on our committees, that you also are included in our development projects. You're also included when it comes to solving problems with public works and our snow removal. And also, I am a business owner. So I understand that when we have to make those tough decisions and compromise when it comes to how we're going to invest into our city services. Thank you. Thank you, Anika. Anika, we're going to stick with you for this first question. This is actually from one of our partners, Sustain St. Paul. The future of the I-94 corridor, which runs through the heart of St. Paul, is currently being considered by MnDOT through the Rethinking I-94 project. Sustain St. Paul and many others believe that the city deserves a future corridor that addresses historical harms to nearby neighborhoods, improves city connectivity across the highway, and reduces vehicle miles traveled and associated vehicle pollution. What elements of a future corridor do you support? Some examples include an at-grade boulevard, a land bridge, a transit-only lane, and reducing the number of vehicle lanes or street width. This is a phenomenal question because transportation is very essential. It's essential to our economy and to our community. I'm also a Rondo um, resident. I have descendants from Rondo, three generations here in St. Paul. So when we talk about 94, we need to also start with the conversation around addressing that harm and repairing that harm. And I also am endorsed by the Twin Cities Rising Sunrise, um, Twin Cities, excuse me, movement where we are ensuring that we have uh, infrastructure and we're investing in um, uh, renewable energy. I think when it comes to this plan, uh, what I have seen is there's uh, several proposals that are invested into not only the economic prosperity, but ensuring that we're addressing um, health disparities as well. I'm someone who has asthma and I uh, would you know, when approaching this decision, we need to make sure that we are actually having the experts in the room who is uh, studying our air quality, doing the proper research, asking the tough questions when it comes to what's going to be best for everyone. Omar? Thank you. Um, I am a, a Rondo resident, and uh, um, I drive here all the time, and uh, I... I support a, a recorrect a random, and uh, because I want to see a, a businesses in here in, in, in here in in, in, in Rondo. and al also I want to see a, um, a, a black history center to build here, and in 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 ninety four, and also uh, um, a. I want to see affordable housing on 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 on, uh, on, on 94. Jeff, well, I, can you hear me? Oh, there we go. I I come from a uh, come at this uh, with a background, and I'm a landscape architect in a previous life. It feels like I've I've worked as a landscape architect, still am, um, and also have a, an urban planning background. So I've I've had a chance to look at both the land bridge proposal and the boulevard proposal. And I would say the land bridge proposal looks, looks to be an excellent proposal that would connect the two sides of 94 and create a bridge between these neighborhoods that have been cut off from each other by the creation of 94. Uh, I think the boulevard proposal is, is not as good. If we look at 8 Mill Road or 35E as it goes through, you know, as it leaves through Southern St. Paul, that's what they're looking at creating. And this is not, they, they say it'll be a pleasant city street. I think it would be quite the opposite. So I, th I would say the land bridge proposal, the land bridge proposal is excellent. The boulevard proposal, not so much. Yen? Talk to, when I talk to the neighborhood in the Rondo, the overwhelming response for the land bridge was negative. They're concerned about to change their neighborhood and they're concerned about the gentrification. Uh, for boulevard idea, I think, uh, my problem with that proposal is uh, there's so many feeding lines going to I-94. If you don't cut off the feeding line, 
we going to spill over all the traffic around the 94. Finally, the transit line. For the, trans the, the uh, designated the transit line, I like it, but on the other hand, we already have the similar line parallel to it, which is light rail. So my question is, if we cannot run our light rail effectively, why we want to introduce another designated uh, um, transit line for the I-94? So I think currently, to me, it's a premature. Suze. Thank you. I have uh, looked into both Reconnect Rondo and the Boulevard Plan, and I find the Boulevard Plan to be vastly superior, and I'll say, I will say that the Reconnect Rondo plan does have one aspect that I would save, which is a black commercial corridor. Uh, I think that's the least that we can do after 94 destroyed a, you know, very pr prosperous black corridor in the 70s. So that part of Reconnect I, I do like. Um, I think having um, a boulevard with bike lanes and per perhaps some transit and just getting rid of 94 would be hugely beneficial and transformative. I know it's a big sell. And you probably don't even know what St. Paul would look like after that. Um, but I've been to Vancouver. There is no major interstate that cuts through the city. It's just back streets. And they have a great urban center. And they have suburbs. And they're able to navigate it just fine. It's, they have also have a lot better transit. So, James? Thank you. Yeah, and looking at the I-94 corridor, the key piece here is community engagement. I'm happy that Amanda are, are doing community engagement, asking for feedback. That is something as the next city council member that I will continue to make sure that we meet with every residence that we can engage in that conversation. Looking at the both, both the model, the, um, the land bridge and the, uh, the Bevelo, uh, Bolivar, the key is, again, there are some pros and cons, right? But the key will be for me is to make sure that we, it's economic prosperity, make sure we address the health piece and the safety piece uh, of the I-94 piece. And I will lead the charge in making sure that we have more engagement, more communications, so that we can do what's best for our local residents here and also the statewide as well. Thank you. Travis? Great question. Um, so I've looked into all of the options that they're proposing, and the few that haven't come up in conversation today are maintaining what is there. Um, which is the least costly option. We're not talking about spending a billion dollars to build a land bridge in Rondo, which I don't know how you can possibly square economically with how it's gonna pay itself back. Um, I think what is there works well. I do drive it basically every day to work. I work in the suburb. And I would not recommend removing it entirely and turning it into a boulevard either. I think what you would find is much, much more traffic congestion in the city. Travis, we're gonna stick with you for this next question. Are you in favor or against the 1% sales tax referendum that's on the ballot? I am opposed to the 1% sales tax referendum. I believe the issue that we have is a failure of trust and a failure of leadership. Why should we trust the current leadership with more of our hard-earned money? They have not been wise with spending what we've given them thus far. They've actually just gotten a temporary influx of, I think, $100 million from the state, which I do not believe the state will be able to continue paying, which they want to spend on other interesting projects. I think we need to be very careful how we spend our money. The city is not fabulously wealthy. We are actually a fairly wealthy city overall. I mean compared with many other countries, we're a very wealthy country. But we cannot squander our resources on foolish experimental policies. We never, we never want to be the first in the world. There are plenty of places that have successful policy that are somehow able to clean their streets, somehow able to maintain their streets, somehow able to plow their streets, yet here we've not been able to find a way. I suggest we find it. James? Yeah, thank you. I am opposed to the 1% sales tax. Uh, referendum. The reason is, or well, are a few things. Most important, the residents. It's going to hurt all you guys. It's going to hurt all of us most vulnerable. If you make very low income or if you make very high income, it's going to hurt all of us, our deep end of the, uh, our, our bottom line. And that's one of the reasons is in looking at the residents, it's going to hurt all of us. The other pieces are businesses. 
Okay, if we raise 1% of sales tax, it's going to hurt our local businesses here. Instead, I've talked to residents, and they say, you know what, James? Instead of shopping here, I'm going to take my business to surround a city. Instead of shopping minorities here, I'm going to take it to another city. And, and to reflect, I've heard from business experts that we are going to, in fact, instead of gaining that money, we're going to actually lose money because our businesses will go somewhere else. So I'm opposed to it. But again, I will, as your city council member, I will make whatever you decide November here on the ballot work. Thank you. Suze. Thank you. Uh, I reluctantly support the 1% sales tax. Uh, we have backed ourselves into a financial uh, corner due to the land assessment uh, ordinance, which ended up getting overturned. Uh, we had planned to get extra revenue for the general fund from it, and then it was found to be illegal. So that's where a lot of our money evaporated to. Um, another problem that this city has, um, well, it's a problem and it's a benefit. We have a lot of nonprofits which are, do wonderful work, but they don't pay into the tax base. Um, cities like Boston have implemented a payment in lieu of taxes program, uh, which allows them to collect voluntary contributions from hospitals, religious institutions, and universities. I think we should implement that as soon as possible to raise some money. Um, if we had more time, I'd say let's support um, or let's, let's get rid of this 1% sales tax because I think sales taxes are regressive. However, we need to raise money to have matching funds for the, inf uh, for the Inflation Reduction Act. We need that money today. We needed it yesterday, honestly. <laughs> Jeff? I oppose the 1% sales tax. Um, we are already seeing an exit of small businesses from St. Paul. It's already happening. We've seen it at the end of our street. Uh, places can't make it. And not everyone's a business owner. You might say, well, why should I care? But we all shop. We need to buy food. We, need to go, we want to go out to dinner. We want to go do things. There are fewer and fewer options because we're making it difficult to, to run a business in St. Paul. Um, you know, we voted for a $15, $15 an hour minimum wage, which is a good thing. But it's made it more difficult for businesses to operate. So as we, as we look at things that we'd like to do and look for ways to fund them, we all have, also have to be aware that this is going to make other things not possible. And those things are, I see those things already happening. Um, so I would oppose the 1% sales tax. Omar? Yes, and I support sales tax. And I know as a small business owner, is it difficult? But our road need. And... Uh, and we need to build our roads. And uh, yes, we need uh, our sales tax go through the through our roads. And and also, look at we have um, um, a, 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 a soccer stadium here, and uh, people come, and all over in Twin City or outside the, uh, um, in Minnesota. Yes, they once they come here, they will pay tax. So, yeah. So. I, yep, I'm in support of sales tax. Anika? I just want to say I truly believe we are worth the penny. We are worth the investment. Uh, talking to neighbors and door knocking and phone banking, a lot of people are upset about the conditions of our infrastructure. Our infrastructure is crumbling, and we have been pointing the fingers to everyone else, but it's really, truly us who needs to put this investment in. Now, when uh, I was asked would I put the burden on property owners, absolutely no, which is why I am choosing to support a sales tax, because I believe everyone should be able to pitch in. We are the capital. Everyone comes here for entertainment. They come here to work at the Capitol. They come here to, to bring their kids here. And they, we should have everyone who's here pitching in that extra penny. I truly believe we are worth the investment. I truly believe this $1 billion of revenue that we will generate, we could put to best use. Um, and I understand, too, a lot of people are tired of taxes going up, but we are worth that investment. Bien. Um, I think uh, already alluded by James, uh, you will hurt the business, uh, middle and the low income people the most, uh, so I absolutely against uh, the 1% uh, tax increase. Uh, I look at the city budget. Um, in 2010, we put 30% of our budget money into public works. 
by now, we only put 23% of our budget money into the public works. Translating into extra dollars, that's $50 million a year. And that has been ongoing for the past 10, over 10 years. So I think the first thing first, the city have to develop a different attitude, how you deal with the city finance. And uh, we just need to reallocating our budget properly by focusing, to, uh, focusing on our core service uh, and go back to our 30% uh, uh, allocation. Yeah, and we're gonna stick with you for this next question. How would you as a city council member address homelessness in St. Paul? So I will have a, well, multiple approach. First, I think for most important, we need to address affordable home ownership. I want to increase our home ownership and the people should have the ability, want to become a homeowner, they should be able to get in it. Now let's talk about the homeless. So basically, in general, I want to move more people into home ownership, therefore they also open their rental place. Homeless, they, to me, there is two types of homeless. One type is the short-term homeless. So let's prevent the short-term homeless from ever happening by preventing, just help them, the assistance, uh, so they're not getting evicted, become homeless. Then let's talk about the long-term homeless. I would say that's a chronic issue. For any chronic issue, there is no short fix. I think we need to figure out what's the root cause, and it has to be a multifaceted approach. Oh, sorry. Anika? So there's multiple approaches to this, and I come with the experience of being a housing advocate and also being someone who was impacted by homelessness as well. So uh, one of the issues, especially from my experience, is how you solve homelessness is you get people homes, right? And here in St. Paul, we have a really low housing stock. We need to bring in developers and contractors to build more housing, um, particularly more multi-family housing, and really invest in like the deep AMI that stands for area median income. That means where who's a, who's the housing's affordable is for the people who actually need it the most. And we also need to ensure that we're representing everyone. So as we're talking about homelessness, how are we connecting with those organizations that advocate for those communities to make sure that they are included in the conversations as we're growing housing in St. Paul? James. Well, thank you. Well, first of all, my family and I, we experienced homelessness when we came here. You know, that feeling of not having a home or living a country that you were born with and then, you know, having to settle in a new country and having to go through public housing and the system to finally have a home uh, that we rented back in 94 was a very difficult transition. So for me, homelessness is something near and dear. Uh, I want to take a multifaceted approach. It's going to be more than just one approach. Right now, we have the homeless assistant response team in the city of St. Paul. So I want to, you know, connect with them, make sure that we have resources through the response team to really address homelessness piece. And then the other two things is affordable housing and quality job. We need to make sure that we work with them to make sure they have a job so they can pay rent so they can't be on the street. Last week, when we were doing a forum at the Rondo Library, we have a lady who came through who's homeless, living down on Frogtown here, and said, you know what, I'm here, and, and I care about this, and we need to get her off the street, but we need to make sure we work with her and connect with her with the right resources and organization, and that's what I would do. Thank you. Travis? This is a great question, and I think it's one of the biggest issues that St. Paul is facing and that America is facing today. Um, first, I think we need to enforce the laws that are on the books. We need to stop this constant begging that's going on at every single street corner, at every single intersection that I drive through. I do not believe that begging is an answer to homelessness. I've personally given tens of thousands of dollars of my own money cash to homeless people. I have a lot of compassion for homeless people. I spend a lot of time personally, with homeless people. There's not an easy solution to this. It's a very challenging question. Um, LA, I saw on the news the other day, wants to reintroduce asylums. They want to force medications on people. I don't believe that's the answer. There's a reason why we got rid of asylums in the first place. We need a heart-centered answer. I personally know a person that 
got a house for free and he couldn't keep it because of drug use. So we can try everything, not everything is going to work. Jeff? Thank you. I think homelessness is probably one of the most difficult issues to deal with as a city. It's, it's not a simple thing. Um, and I think often the deeper issue is a mental health problem or a, a addiction problem. I think those are things, those are factors that need to be dealt with um, by the city and by our, our, our mental health and hospital infrastructure. Uh, there's also an issue of, there are vacant houses. I've been flyering, boy, there's, there's quite a few vacant houses in St. Paul. And I would like to see the city make a greater effort to make those houses available, you know, not to, to um, foreclose on buildings that are sitting vacant and make the permitting easy in order to allow people to move into houses who are ready to own, own a single family home, if that's possible. Thank you. Omar? Yeah, well, thank you. I, I know is when I hear homeless is my eye is a watering and I have seen it a hom a homeless, even my neighbor. And, and even last night somebody evicted my neighbor. It's tough here in St. Paul. And one thing I'm so proud is that um, like beginning of the year um, as a planning commission, we, ha we had it, um, a one to four unit housing that uh, we approved it that will expand uh, um, a, 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 a developer can build housing in St. Paul. And that, that can um, uh, help um, uh, affordable housing, can build the developers, can help the, the homeless. It's, it's tough, yes, but we needed to stop evicting to our, to the, our community in, 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 in St. Paul. And, I, and, um, and, and, and if you hear that the home line and, and the lawyers, they do a good job for uh, um, bringing back to the, in life to the, uh, uh, in, in our neighbors. I, I, yes, we needed to do a lot of, 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 of the work, but we're going to lead in St. Paul. Suze? Uh, homelessness concerns me very personally. My mother was homeless due to severe mental illness when I was a child. I had to live with my dad, and uh, she lived in a homeless shelter. And she said that people were kicked out every other day for smoking a joint or doing drugs. And, and she said, well, I don't know how they're going to get clean if they're homeless. And I said, that's a great point. And I really think that the work that St. Paul's doing right now is fantastic. There's a lot of wonderful nonprofits that are helping people um, find housing and uh, get treatment uh, for, for drug addiction. Uh, my big thing is rent control. Um, the best way to prevent people from being homeless is to keep them from being priced out of housing. And I'd like to end um, outside investment. Uh, I don't want people buying up house, houses and turning them into Airbnbs who don't live in St. Paul. I don't want people who don't live in St. Paul to be buying up our apartment buildings uh, and jacking up the rent. So, you know, there's ways that we can help keep people in housing. And, uh, and you know, I'm also just open to working with the community and, and making sure people have housing, like housing first. Suze, we're gonna stick with you for the next question. How would you, as a member of the city council, work with the mayor? Well, speaking of people who do a lot for people dealing with homelessness, I really support a lot of um, the mayor's programs. I think he's doing a fantastic job really addressing direct root causes of poverty, like um, not having money. I know it sounds glib, but I do believe the best way to get people out of poverty is to give them money. I know that certainly isn't something that everyone agrees with, but it's in my experience, it. it seems to be working in other cities that have tried it. Um, I really like uh, helping people with their down payment of their home, um, the inheritance fund, or I, I believe that's what it's called. And uh, I, you know, the guaranteed basic income. Uh, I really like what the mayor's doing and I would help him you know, keep, keep going on with what he's doing and then offer my own pragmatic solutions and, and do my best to support him. Omar? Can you repeat the question? I can. How would you, as a member of the city council, work with the mayor? Well, you know, uh, compromise. And, uh, you know, w the city council and the mayor and work, we'll, we'll work together and make sure that um, um, all the, in, in, in all the agenda goes through the, the, the city. And, 
Hey, hey look. We, um, the city council that, that here is there now, you know, the city, uh, the mayor, and the, they do compromise. So we'll be compromising the agendas and also like any of uh, um, the, the agenda come through that will be a compromising. Travis? That's a great question. Um, I think it's probably pretty obvious that I disagree fairly strongly with a lot of what the mayor has done and is doing. I would challenge the mayor to think diff differently about a number of different topics. I would attempt to persuade him to change the direction that he's going down. I don't dislike him personally. I mean, I don't know him personally, unlike probably several of the people up here with me. But I do think that it's possible to persuade him, assuming he's not a strict ideologue, which some of his actions do seem to mark him out to be. Um, if he's unconvincible, unpersuadable, I would oppose him. And I would do my best to prevent him from passing policies that I know would damage this community. Yen? Um, that's a, yes, it's a, it's a great question. I guess uh, in April, I did approach him. I think at first I would like to let him know what we are thinking. And so in April this year, once I analyzed the budget, I did approach him and ask him to look into my website because I think it is important for the future of St. Paul for 2024 budget year, we, he should be thinking again how to uh, do, uh, allocate his budget. Um, nothing happened, but I guess I will try my best, um, talk to him, show him the data, show him the result, and uh, bring the voice of the community to, to him, and I hope uh, we can come up with good solutions. Anika? Absolutely. I think Ward 1 particularly needs a strong partner who has positive relationships with the mayor, Mayor Carter. I'm the only candidate in this race that he has endorsed um, as the Ward 1 City Council. Uh, I plan to work with him continuously, um, particularly around making our neighborhood safer, um, expanding on the community first public safety, ensuring that we are investing in crime prevention initiatives, as well as expanding and making sure our pilots, um, like the universal basic income, um, similar to the reparations commission and other initiatives are successful. Um, I also plan to work, at, uh, work with the mayor at the Capitol in uh, making sure that we're partnering with our senator and our congresswoman to ensure that we have the investments here. Uh, it's going to take the expertise. It's going to take the strong level of brain trust to be able to know where all these relationships and all the leverages um, of initiatives that we need here in St. Paul. And I'm that candidate who has that relationship and also has that uh, experience to ensure that we have the resources to make our city successful. Jeff? I first met Mayor Carter when he was running for Ward 1 City Council, just like we all here are right now. Uh, and I was impressed. He's very pragmatic. Uh, he, looks at, he looks at both sides of the issue. Um, and I've, I appreciate the way he's really taken the 3% rent control um, uh, ballot initiative and helped to balance the, the needs of developers with the needs of renters in St. Paul and try to find a way that everybody can, can win. Um, so I think, you know, I, I look forward to, to working with Mayor Carter because I think he's someone who really, uh, really, you know, thinks deeply about, about the, the issues before him. James. Thank you. Well, I think Mayor Carter is an amazing individual. Uh, but most importantly here, my point are two things is this one is I'm a team player. So I'm going to work with the mayor, but I'm not working for the mayor. I'm working for you all. So I want you to know that. So my goal is to bring your voices, your concern, and bring that to City Hall to make sure that we have a balance of power. I know the mayor's office has a lot of power and a lot of say. So we need, I'm gonna be that council member who is gonna work with the mayor, but also with the city council to balance that power to make sure we're moving um, St. Paul in the right direction. Um, in addition to that, again, for me, it's gonna be data driven, it's gonna be community voice, and it's gonna make sure that we, we work on all issues with the mayor here. So again, working together is gonna to be key. And how we do it, Again, it's going to depend on all you guys and your concern. So thank you. 
James, we're going to stick with you for this next question. Do you support the proposal to raise property taxes in 2024 to pay for child care and early childhood education? Thank you. So this is a um, sensitive topic for me as an educator and someone who has seven kids. So I want to make the distinction here is this. Do I support it? The answer will be no, because I believe that as a homeowner, as people resident, we live here, property taxes are going up the roof, and enough is enough. We are paying more just to invest and live here in the inner city. So that's not okay. So property taxes is not the answer, but I do value our kids. I do value that they should have child care, quality child care. So what I would do is, as your council member, I will lead the charge here with the mayor, and we are going to go to the state level with our surplus here. We're going to ask more money, or we're going to ask money to take care of this issue with child care. It should not be coming from our city property taxes. It should come somewhere else. And I want to be creative and work to make sure we leverage those resources at the state level. Thank you. Jeff? Well, I would agree with James uh, largely. I think this is a, a valuable service to provide. But we're in a state that has an $18 billion surplus, last I heard, and uh, our city can't plow its streets. So I think that's a, a pretty stark contrast. I don't think the city uh, ought to be providing this uh, very valuable very valuable service when the state uh, can and probably should with the, the surplus that it has. Anika? So similar to what um, everyone was sharing, Child care is very expensive. My, uh, my brother pays over about $600 a week for child care. Uh, we actually had to use um, one of the former child care as um, my mom and my, <laughs> and my dad, you know. And a lot of families this um, generation, a lot of families now don't have the kinship, don't have the relationships um, to be able to afford child care. So this is definitely something that's necessary. Uh, I am excited to work um, on the city council and work with our county and also our state to ensure that there is major investments in child care. I think this is something that we can um, make happen, but I don't think it should be on the backs of our property owners to pay for it. Also, um, for someone who's worked in nonprofits for over 15 years, we have seen um, you know, a level of infrastructure that's necessary to m make sure this program is successful. So. Travis? Raising property taxes to fund universal child care. This is a great question. And I agree that child care prices are out of control and we need to find a way to help people raise their children. Um, I remember when I was a kid, I got child care from someone who wasn't allowed to have a business in her home because her windows weren't wide enough by like three inches. So she was doing under the table child care, and therefore my mother, who's a single mother, got a very good deal. Okay, why did that have to happen? Because of regulations. And actually, when we look at child care, the reason it's so out of control has a lot to do with how it's regulated. You need to have so many people per child to be involved in the business, and the regulations are what has taken it out of the reach for the vast majority of families. I do not personally see how a government, an organization, that utterly fails to achieve vital, critical um, programs for everyone plowing the streets, for instance, wants to, who wants to trust their children to them? Why? Ian? Sorry. <coughs> I was, uh, <laughs> I agree with, uh, um, I think I'm virtually um, both of uh, um, what they said. Um, Yes, I disagree the increase our property tax for the child care. Uh, I do believe child care should be provided universally, and uh, I think it should be state funding, um, because uh, for the same reason, the regulation should be simple and should be unified, and they shouldn't be picking um, basically value between city to city. And uh, our city currently paying the highest property tax rate in Minnesota. I just cannot bear the thought to e continually increase our property tax rate in order to provide child care just a few for select few people. Suze? 
Thank you. Well, I'm going to go against the flow and say that I do plan to vote yes on the property tax increase for universal um, early childhood education. I don't think there's a single uh, investment that would return a greater positive result to our city than universal access to daycare for very small children. Um, it will allow more people, especially women, to get back into the workforce. A lot of women had to stop working during the shutdown because they had to stay home with their kids uh, to help them with remote learning. Uh, it, early childhood education has an absolute, it's a panacea of benefits to our society. And uh, I own my own house, so I, I get it. Our property taxes are high, but for this particular thing, I'm gonna have to say that I support it. I did meet with Rebecca Necker, and she talked to me about it, and I, I'm sold. I think it's gonna be great. Omar. Uh, thank you. Um, I, to me, is I don't believe to borrow on property tax and to uh, fund it, and uh, it's, 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 it is, it's already our property tax going high. And, uh, um, but I support um, our education, I support our child and our, 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 um, um, our spark. And uh, yes, we can get money from, uh, um, from the state and from local government, but not just, you know, fun, um, and adding uh, um, um, the property tax. Omar, we're gonna stick with you for the next question. Do you support St. Paul's current rent control ordinance, which caps increases at 3% annually, or seek an exemption? If not, what would an ideal policy look like? Thank you. Um, well, I voted uh, um, a rent control, and, uh, um, but I also I like a change that re-modify, that, that, that change that uh, went through the city councils. And that can um, open up the door for our uh, developers. And uh, yes, we need, uh, we need developers in St. Paul. And uh, yes, that, that uh, policy um, works to everyone because of, uh, of uh, um, a change. Um, and uh, we need a developer in St. Paul to build our housing. And I do support uh, and, uh, to change, uh, and I rent, rent, I'm a renter. Yes, I need to uh, lower my rent, but and we also need uh, uh, developers to build housing in, in, in St. Paul. And I support in, 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 in rent control as it is now. Travis? So I am a renter and I oppose rent control. I don't personally see how it's constitutional to control someone's property in that way. Obviously, they were able to pass the law and somehow it's thus far survived in the courts. But I also work in construction, so I'm personally aware of projects that got canceled because of it. Now, I admit that they did make some changes, but I don't, I, what we need to do to create affordable housing is create opportunity in the city through economic development. We need to, again, bring businesses back into the city, r retain the businesses we have, so that people can get good paying jobs. Then they can afford rent. And then in increased development, good development of basically better properties that people wanna live in. I mean, I live in kind of a junky apartment because I'm poor. Um, I'm sure a lot of people in this room are in the same boat, but you shouldn't control a landlord because of that. Ian? Um, no. Um, the reason why is the rental control would never work, even in the ideal situation. The, um, the problem is when, you, when the people is under the rental control umbrella, they wouldn't want to move, regardless of their life situation changes. And is that causing a rental market stagnation? People, the younger generation, people, newcomer, they cannot move into your market and they cannot find affordable housing. So what would be the ideal solution? I, in my website, I proposed that. It might be hard to explain. Um, it's tied into transparency. I think a renter needed to understand what they are paying for. So I'm hoping by 
open the dialogue uh, so we can make shopping for rent as transparent as uh, shopping for a can of tomato soup. You decide what you're paying for. Anika? So, I, in 2019, I did vote for rent control. It was during a time when we were uh, advocating for housing. Um, we were also made a strong movement to uh, um, believe in development without displacement, right? And I think rent control is one instrument and one tool um, in our toolkit that we can use to address housing affordability. Um, but as an advocate, I definitely believe that we need to really look at how we are creating more opportunities for people to get into housing. Also, major investments in diversifying our developers. In the business of housing, it's all about the developer and who we're bringing to the table. So I think we do need to listen um, and um, have an array of um, opportunities to partner. Another thing uh, I am planning to do is have major investments in home ownership. I think if we can get someone a home, we don't have to have a conversation about rent, right? We need to ensure that we're having not only economic prosperity, but community stabilization, and we need all partners on deck to do that. Jeff? Well, I'm a homeowner and also a landlord, and I think the 3% increase that's passed by ballot initiative needs to stand because that's the voice of the people. I think direct democracy is important, and we need to listen to people when they say they want to see rent stabilized. I think it's becoming very expensive for young people to live in this city, and just like I feel like property taxes need to be held down for the, the sake of homeowners, I think rent needs to be controlled as well, and that really hasn't been you know, dealt with up until now by St. Paul. I would additionally suggest, and this is something that in the city council, on the city council I would suggest, capping uh, landlord's expenses at 3%. If they can't raise rent more than 3% per year, their property taxes should be capped at 3% per year, uh, rise in year, uh, and also the utilities that are controlled by the city should be capped at 3% per year. Since the city controls trash now and has a, a contract with Excel, I mean, that's only fair. If landlords can't raise their income, their expenses should be frozen as well. James? Well, thank you. You know, this topic of rent stabilization is always an ongoing process, and um, it's difficult because we, as I'm at the door, I'm hearing both sides of the story. I'm talking to renters where they say, I, we like the 3%, or we want to cap it that. That's helping me out quite a bit, so I don't have to stress about my landlord, you know, skyrocketing uh, my rent every, um, every so often. On the other hand, I'm also hearing from landlord and also property owners where they say, hey, James, you know, I, we, this doesn't make sense to us. We, we, are not, we are not necessarily ripping them off, but we, it does not make sense for us to do this business here in St. Paul. So what I would do is, as a candidate, as your city council member, I will revisit this, and we have to revisit this and look at this again and see how do we make it work for both parties here so St. Paul can continue to prosper here in St. Paul. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's a lot of things that we need to iron out, and I will leave that charge for us to revisit this to see how we can make it work. Thank you. Suze? Thank you. Um, I support the rent control ordinance. Um, I've had m way too many friends uh, priced out of housing. They posted on Facebook, well, I just saw that my rent is going up 30% and I have to move now. And I am weary of those posts by my friends. And, you know, I've offered my, my sofa to friends who couldn't live in their apartments anymore. Um, I've helped people out with rent through GoFundMes, but you know, I think rent stabilization, if that accomplishes keeping people in their houses and keeps people from being homeless, I think that's a positive thing for our city. And I do agree about keeping development in St. Paul and making St. Paul more attractive for developers. Um, I would like to use TIF financing and other uh, ways to make our city more attractive to developers, but not, not getting rid of rent control. I think it's, it's going to have a very beneficial effect on our city. Thank you. Anika, we're going to go to you next. As a city council member, what would you support to make our neighborhoods more walkable? 
Absolutely. So I think this takes a holistic approach. Um, I'm excited to get into the public works and also more so like the main business of city services. Um, and that's ensuring that we have all different type of options to help our families get from A to B. Uh, I plan on working with our department um, directors and ensuring that we have a common sense um, approach around what's really doable. Talking with voters, uh, one of the things they want to see is safer streets. They want to ensure that we have visible stop signs. We also have quite a few elementary schools and recreation centers and libraries and major intersections, and ensuring that we have modernize um, technology to make sure we are um, accessible to all abilities. Uh, we also have people who are in wheelchairs, are, um, also have um, aids and dogs, right, to help them. So we want to make sure that we have all um, abilities at the table when we're deciding on our infrastructure. Omar. Yes. Um, what was the question again? As a city council member, what would you support to make our neighborhoods more walkable? Uh, well, um, bike lane. I will support the bike lane and make sure that we have a bikes in 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 the sample. And also, um, um, when on winter time, we need to s uh, plow our our uh, um, and, 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 and uh, s uh, streets, and, and people can walk. And also, I want to see that um, um, our uh, um, a, 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 um, uh, our neighbors can have a farmers in, in here in, in, in World One. Yeah. Jeff? Well, I think there's some areas where sidewalks still need to be completed, actually, in St. Paul. I know there's probably fewer in Ward One, but there's some areas where there's just a dirt path next to the street uh, in, I guess, what was once grass. So I'd like to see um, when permits are pulled, if there's not a sidewalk alongside the road, that needs to be completed. I don't think it's acceptable that you know that uh, someone can build a, an apartment building or a house and not have a sidewalk in front of their house. I think that those need to be completed. Um, additionally, I think uh, better enforcement of uh, of snow shoveling. Essentially, the city says that if you don't shovel your walk, you'll be ticketed. It never happens. Uh, I I think the the city should invest some more resources and actually giving tickets to people who never shovel their walks, because it's you know, often the same house in the block that doesn't have a shoveled walk. We walk a lot uh, to the store, and if there's one sidewalk, one stretch of sidewalk that's, that's icy, it essentially cuts you off from being able to walk to, to get groceries. Yen? Um, I guess uh, the first thing is really make the sidewalk even, because uh, for people, for people who um, have a stroller, have a wheelchair, they cannot pass in a lot of sidewalks. And uh, also, when you design street, design it uh, with uh, um, people in mind, uh, because there is a, sometimes I saw um, they just uh, draw a cross line. And uh, was the idea people will use it, uh, but it's actually by introducing a cross line, it can introduce a lot more um, danger because if the car doesn't see you. So I think we need to think about how to design our street better. Suze. Thank you. Uh, one thing about uh, pedestrian you know, ease of getting around is there's lots of other cities that have great policies that make them more walkable and there's no reason we have to start from scratch, and reinvent the wheel, so to speak. Um, I would love for there to be an occasional street in St. Paul that has no motorized traffic, except for possibly, you know, like an e-bike, an e I would not consider that motorized traffic. Um, Amsterdam has great walkable cities and people come from all over the world to walk their streets and say, wow, why can't America be like this? And why can't America be like this? That's what I say. Um, as a, someone who does not have a car, I do walk and bike and take the bus everywhere. And I have noticed uh, you take your life in your hand when you try to cross the street. People don't always stop for you, even at marked crosswalks, even when you have uh, the walk symbol. Uh, it's, it's alarming. So uh, I'd say no turn on red uh, is another thing I would like to do. And uh, we could use some more road diets. So 
making the roads a bit narrow, like the streets a bit narrower, um, and then having better bike cycling infrastructure so cyclists don't have to um, bike on the sidewalk. Thank you. James. Thank you. I think Singapore, we have a beautiful city and we have a lot of business here and we should walk more. And that's gonna help me with the bully too as well, right? So for me to support this, I would want is to work public work department. I think the public work department needs to be a system of repair that is transparent. So we got, I'm gonna make sure that we have a system that is easy, that if we see something that needs to be repaired in our particular neighborhood, that we submit it through this website, it makes it really easy for us to submit, and that we get a tracking of when it's getting done so that we could get those fixed, right? When we fix our sidewalk, we will walk more. Um, and the other piece is safer street, and then the other piece here is this. I have so many ideas in terms of like, we should do something like Walk St. Paul. We're with our local businesses here and walk to different stores, different flea markets, and, and really celebrate the beauty of St. Paul. So my piece is working from the city government level to working with you all. We could definitely walk more and we will be a healthier and a better city. So thank you. Travis. I really like this question because I, I don't think there's too many politics in it. I think we all love this city and we all wanna make a more walkable city. And we've got some great ideas. I've heard some great ideas up here today. Um, number one for me is crime. You know, if you got a really crime-ridden neighborhood, people don't wanna walk in it, they don't feel safe. So if we're not actually combating crime, combating theft, combating carjackings, all these different aspects of it, if you got gunshots going off in your neighborhood every, every night, no one's, no one's gonna walk around in it. I'm fortunately lucky that I live close to the Summit Avenue and it's a historic neighborhood, it's beautiful. There's a build a pass to tear the entire thing up and it's gonna ruin my walk. I got a brand new puppy, I love walking this two miles every day. Please don't tear this street up. Um, plant trees today, because our grandchildren are gonna walk under them. We want more shade. I know we just had to cut all these trees down because of uh, whatever the disease was and we gotta plant a variety of trees so we don't re produce the same problem. Oh. Two, in, two inches insulation under the sidewalks is something I've heard in Duluth, and it actually can prevent the heaving. So I think we could approach that way. We're gonna talk about snow. <laughs> it's, it's time. Travis, we're gonna stick with you. What specific policies would you support if elected to improve snow plow operations on St. Paul streets? Okay, so I've lived in Minneapolis as well as St. Paul. So you, literally, you go across the, the river and somehow the streets get plowed better. Why is that? Well, for one, they're much, much better at getting the, the cars off the streets. I don't know if it's the ticketing, I don't know, but people maybe are more scared of it. I think they actually just remove the cars. So if you tow the cars, plow the streets, you don't have the problem. I get there's an expense to it, it pays for itself, and people, if they don't learn the lesson, they're gonna have big bills. Sorry if it happens, but you gotta get off that side of the street when it's time to plow it. It's really that simple. Fixing the streets, I guess, is the next question. I personally blew a tire right in front of the governor's mansion this winter, okay? So why are we allowing our streets to get this bad? We need to actually maintain our infrastructure so we're not living through hell for six months every year. J James. Yeah. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, you know, I, when I think of snowplow, I think of my 80-year-old aunt who drives down St. Paul during winter and her back, every time she parks, she's like, James, my back is killing me because all the, all the road condition and the snow not being plowed and being compressed, right? So this is a big issue. This is a piece where this is non-negotiable. City Simple has to do better. As your council member, I will lead the charge here to make sure that we make snow plowing a priority, not after we set the snow and compress it for so many vehicles, right? So we have to make this a priority. I think it's a two thing part. It's a money issue and it's also a personnel, people, right? Staffing, right? And the other piece here is vehicle as well. So we have to look and work with our, um, um, again, public work department here and say, what are the needs? Why are we not getting it plowed properly? I used to live shortly in Roseville and live shortly in White Bear Lake and they do a phenomenal job. City of St. Paul, we got to our city accountable and we have to do better. So that's what I would do, is make sure we revisit this, make sure we have the system in place and we gotta hold our public work accountable. So thank you. Suze. Plowing, yeah. Um, that, uh, I think a big part of why we aren't plowing is we ran out of money, which is really sad. 
uh, we're this capital city and we ran out of money for plowing. I remember I saw some sort of social media post or some press release by the city government saying something about the unexpected snowfall. <laughs> and I was like, uh, it's Minnesota between October and April. None of the snowfall should be unexpected at this point, I wouldn't think. Um, so that is why I support payment in lieu of taxes. I know I said that before. Um, I want to really outline what I mean by that, though, because uh, it pertains to what we're talking about. Um, co collecting voluntary contributions from nonprofit entities like universities, hospitals, and religious institutions um, could create a dedicated pot of money. So I don't mean the general fund, I mean a specific dedicated pot of money that would be for essential city services. So road repair, um, water and sewage, and plowing. And I think having that would help kind of sequester the funds so it, there'd be no temptation to use those funds for anything else. And I think that's really key. Jeff. I agree with Suze. Uh, she's right. Uh, in St. Paul, we have 30%, I think more than 30% of landowners are government, nonprofit, religious institutions. They're not paying for our infrastructure. And I know this, the state Supreme Court had a ruling on this a few years ago that stopped St. Paul from uh, collecting the, the, they called it different, something different, a street fee. Assessments. Uh, assessments, thank you. Uh, I think we need, to, we need to try to, we need to find a new way to do this because it's, it's not right that 30 plus percent of the landowners in the city are paying nothing towards the infrastructure that is supporting them as well as everyone else. Um, and I, Travis is right about Minneapolis. They're a big city too, they plow their streets. I drive every day to Minneapolis, they get plowed. Not, maybe not as, not, not like the suburbs. You know, the, the answer often is, well, we're the city, we're not the suburbs, we can't get all this, the cars off the street. Well, Minneapolis does it. You know, if there's, I know we're kind of allergic to saying we, need, we could learn from Minneapolis, but in this case, we could learn from Minneapolis. <laughs> Omar. Uh, thank you. Um, as it, it, when we hear a snowblower that will continue every year, but we need a solution. And uh, uh, my uh, cousin, uh, he's a driver of the, uh, the uh, um, public, public walk at uh, St. Paul. And, uh, I was talking to him, and I said, he drives a uh, snowblower every uh, um, and, and, and winter time. And I was talking, what, what need to be changed? One thing he says that we needed to board a, a GPS to our, our, our snowblowers. And that we, that we know what, what our, where everything can, and, and where our uh, more snowblowers and, and is, and it's, it's snows is. So, and we need to make sure, yes, we need to get the fund. We need to hire more our, our, um, our uh, we need to hire more uh, um, our public work uh, to do the job. But to get that, we need the money, we need to get the money from our state to make sure that we have a money from, to boop up our, our, our hiring. Anika. So this one is actually one of my favorite um, questions because right when I announced my campaign, my neighbor called me and asked me, so are you sure you want me to start calling you and bugging you whenever the snow falls, right? And I shared with her that absolutely, I lived here all my life. Um, and I think when we talk about our snow removal plan, it's really one around efficiency um, and also quite frankly, equity. Uh, because the question raises when we do see a huge level um, of snow removals, uh, we often notice that our blocks are not recognized, right, aren't invested into. So we need to ensure that we have a leader who's going to be on the city council making sure that it's a quick response rate. Um, and also when we talk about equity, um, from a business standpoint, we need to ensure that we have the staff, the level of employees. We are dealing with a vacancy issue here in St. Paul. So ensuring that we're promoting job opportunities so we have the bandwidth to deal with um, our high level of winters um, coming up because it's, it's coming up soon. <laughs> so. Yen? As I said already, uh, we're underfunding our public works. So clearly, they do have a reason why it's not, not a proud public. So I think first thing first is really we have to fund them properly. Next, 
even in the worst uh, financial situation, I think a public works is still responsible for not plowing properly. They need to come up a plan. And as a city, we can work with them. That's okay. Whatever they need, we can, um, we can help, the, we can organize the community to do what they want. But I think public works first have to reflect uh, on what has done wrong, and they need to come up a plan. Yeah, and we're gonna stick with you for this next question. If you're elected to the city council, what will you suggest to bring businesses back to St. Paul? Um, first thing I think is crime. We need to reduce crime. With crime, there is no way um, business wanted to stay. So I think uh, when I talk to the business people, when the business getting established, they actually doing quite well in our place. But uh, when the crime is uh, rampant around the neighborhood, uh, this become a problem. So I would say crime is the number one issue. And uh, also just uh, really listen to the, um, to the business uh, uh, community and uh, trying to understand uh, how we can support them, keep the street clean, do the basic service, uh, and uh, make sure we give them the feeling that neighbor, their business are welcome in the city sample, not against them. Anika? Yeah, I think this is, as a business owner, um, and I speak with uh, tons of business owners, one of the things that uh, attracts them here is obviously clientele, right? Clientele and also their commitment to wanting to be in their community. Uh, so I think as a city council member, we need to have someone that is able to have those conversations on an intergovernment agency level, right? So when, when there is construction coming down, um, so be Avenue, that we have a city council member that understands um, the relationship with what's going on with MnDOT, right, and be able to convey um, some of those challenges and also come up with solutions. We also need a city council member that takes great pride in its city and is going to promote and support and work with those business owners, hosting events and ensuring that we have a vibrant cultural corridor so we're in the summertime or all across the seasons, we're promoting uh, more opportunities for businesses to come out and meet new customers. And um, lastly, I'll just say also investing in our neighborhood um, councils. I think they do a really great job with little money um, to ensure that our businesses are here in St. Paul. James. Thank you. But to me, businesses, you know, as a small business owner myself and also my family, my entire family, almost every of my siblings are in some sort of business. And, you know, business is a way to make sure you come up with poverty, right? You work hard so that you could earn a little bit more, right? Versus a salary. So we need to attract businesses back to St. Paul. You know, um, they were gonna look at their bottom line. If I'm gonna relocate to St. Paul, especially in Ward 1, what are the incentives? How am I gonna get my clientele? How am I gonna make sure my business is thriving or successful to meet, make sure that it offset my cost, right? So we have to do some this is a piece where we have as a city an obligation to work with them, to persuade them, to let them know that the Ward 1 here is the place to do business. We are a multicultural uh, location here. This is the center. We are the heart of St. Paul. We should be able to do that. So I will lead that charge to make sure that their bottom line, they, are, they can be successful. The other piece here is working with St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce. Just had an interview with them this morning. And the key here is to leverage them and their expertise and to listen to all the business experts here to make sure that we bring business back here to St. Paul. Thank you. Travis. This is the best question of the night. Um, I think it's probably one of the most important things that we're facing as a city. We have a, I would say, 50% vacancy rate in our commercial properties. So we're just talking about how we have no housing. We can't find any housing, it's not affordable. Well, why, don't, why aren't people clamoring to get into these properties? Why do we got properties been sitting empty for a decade or longer in downtown St. Paul? This is not a new issue. This doesn't go back to the pandemic. This is a very long standing issue. It's a trend and we need to turn it around. This should be being done by the mayor's office. There should be someone in the mayor's office calling every single big business, every single developer saying, what do we got to do to bring you into this town? I haven't seen that happening and I'm not sure how you could convince somebody to come into this business environment. 
we're going to raise taxes on you every single year. We're going to raise your property taxes. We're going to raise your sales taxes. How are you going to do business? You can't expect what's going to come the next year. So you need to actually bring a consistency to the approach and message. Secondly, crime. We need to reduce crime. Jeff. There's a, a place at the end of our street. It's in Ward 1 uh, in a little strip mall. Um, Habanero Tacos. The, my favorite place to eat in Minneapolis. I love, I love their food. And they put up a sign opening this fall in spring of 2022. The sign's still up, opening this fall. It's fall. I, I sympathize with them. I, I'm a small business owner too. And dealing with the, uh, the regulations, with the bureaucracy of you know, interacting with the city, it's, it's, it's difficult, it's painful. Um, it shouldn't have to be that hard. You couple that with very high property taxes in the city um, and a $15 minimum wage, you've, you've created a very difficult business environment. It's, when you're opening a small business, you're risking everything. You're risking losing everything. And when you're doing it in a, in a place that doesn't support you, it, it makes it a very hard, it makes the calculus very difficult. And I think there's a lot of things we could change to make St. Paul much friendlier to small business. Um, too much for me to, to talk about right here, but I think there's a lot that can be done. Omar. Uh, thank you. Um, I, as a small business owner here in St. Paul and War One, I know it's not easy to open business, but in, we have uh, uh, our Balanin economy in, 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 in St. Paul that have uh, uh, a a starting program, like a, a, a grant program. And we need to put the grant program in, in place that people who want to start a business in St. Paul. And also we can work on an organization like NDC. They are in World War One, And we can work with them that uh, can train the new people who want to start a business in, in War One. And uh, um, yes, is it, it is hard to start a business, business in St. Paul also, and to make sure that in city can have um, a voyager or, 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 or a small loan that, um, that uh, um, a, a businesses can open here, in, in the, the businesses can open here in, in St. Paul. And I will work with uh, our planning economy to make sure that we have a grant that um, new businesses can have. Suze. In order to assist small businesses, uh, the first thing I would do is be at their disposal uh, to help with any kind of red tape or city ordinances that they need help with. I would also work to take away any unnecessary regulations. Um, I do support the $15 an hour minimum wage. So when I say regulations, I'm not talking about worker protections or minimum wage. I mean more like, you know, sillier, more frivolous um, restrictions. I remember there was a Minneapolis ordinance that said the bar couldn't be visible from outside on the sidewalk because a child could see you pouring a glass of wine. So they had to pour the glass of wine on the, on the counter under the bar, which there's probably things like that that we could do away with in St. Paul. Um, but I would also like to just have better plowing of the sidewalks. I know we don't really plow the sidewalks, but people will go to local small businesses if they can, if they can walk and bike there. So that's a big thing that I would do. We have one more question. We've been getting so many good questions. We're going to ask it in lieu of closing statements. Before that, this question was also asked a lot. So this is just a yes or no. Uh, we're going to start at Jeff and just work our way down. Do you support the Summit Avenue Regional Trail Plan as passed by the St. Paul City Council? No. Suze. Enthusiastically, yes. Omar. Yes, I support it. I voted even. And in our uh, planning commission. Okay. And we need a, a road need to be built. James. For the people's voice, it's round no. Travis. No. Ian. Um, a weak no. Overall, it's a no, except the region between Lexington to Arundel. Between Lexington to Arundel, the bike lane is super narrow and uh, it's loud. Okay. So in order to do it right, I think we can 
uh, widen the bike lens slightly by 10 to 20 inch. We're Only 10 do, to 20 inch. We're going to do no with an asterisk. It's a soft no. But I, otherwise, it's a beautiful trail. I really don't want to change it. Got it. But it's just the one section. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Anika. <laughs> no. All right, for our last question in lieu of closing statements, this is from the audience, and we're actually going to work on the opposite way that we did opening statements. So, Anika, we're going to start with you. As a city council member, what is your vision for St. Paul? Well, my vision is vibrant. My vision is for us to be courageous um, and resilient and also committed to um, leadership here in city council. I'm prioritizing ensuring that we have a safer community. Over um, 15 years of my career has been ensuring that we have investments in young people um, and also they have a prosperous future. I also am someone who um, thrive in the economics and entre entrepreneurship. We need to ensure that we're promoting our businesses and people are seeing this as a place to grow, grow um, their families and also grow their lives here. I'm also an artist. Um, I've worked on plenty of projects. I worked on the Dell Street project and worked on also on the Rondo Land Trust, ensuring that we have a very vibrant corridor here where people can take pride in their community and also have a seat at the table. I believe that uh, we are stronger together when we are solving problems together, and I'm here to be that leader that we can trust, that we can work with, and who's courageous to ensure that we're asking the hard questions, but also um, ensuring that we are making the solutions that work for everybody. Yen. I have seen other city, um, like uh, Taiwan, San Francisco, when people cannot have uh, affordable home uh, housing. So for me, it's essential we have affordable home ownership because we cannot uh, stop uh, investors coming into our city. But the one thing as a city we can do is make sure we assist the people move into home ownership. How to do that? I will ask every one of you, make sure your neighbors, everybody start building their credit score. Without a good credit score, you're never able to move into home ownership. So let's do that, and we can make our city resist from outside influence. Travis. My vision for this city is a thriving, clean, beautiful city, safe and just. Justice is just as important as safety. Growing, which means a thriving business environment. We need to be bringing businesses back to the city. We used to have huge, 3M used to be here. There used to be all kinds of businesses. They have fled over the last several decades. We need to find a way to bring the development that's going on all over the country right here into St. Paul. I would focus on redeveloping single family homes, continuing the strong trajectory we have. We have 51% of people are in owner-occupied homes. That's half the community. I think a lot of the other visions that you're seeing floating around are about creating a population of renters. And it's how do we, and it basically, how do you be controlled? I'm a renter. How do we give people control over their own lives as they own their own home? That's one of the biggest things. Uh, united. I want to see a community that's united behind similar values and and the divisiveness. James. Well, thank you. Uh, for me, my vision is to create a better St. Paul. I believe St. Paul is a great city already, but we can make it better. And there's a lot of things that we could do, but the core piece for me is we have to make sure that what one in St. Paul is people-centered democracy, that your voices are heard at City Hall. A lot of time, to me, decisions are made behind closed doors. And we go to city council meeting and they don't even pay attention. There's not much community engagement. That's not what I'm about. As your next city council member, I will listen to you. We will solve our complex issue together. And again, we're gonna create a city of St. Paul that everybody will get their fair share because we need to invest back in what one here to make sure businesses are thriving, we have better school, we have safer neighborhood, we have more accessibility here in St. Paul and what one here, and so that we have a better quality of life. No one wants to live in St. Paul and say, oh, I don't take pride in it. I just live in it, but I want to be somewhere else. No, it's time that we reinvest back in St. Paul and to make sure that we take that pride and have quality of life 
and make our city of St. Paul better. So bottom line here is this, if you're looking for a candidate that has excellent work ethic, someone you can trust, that's gonna say what he says and follow what he says, I'm that candidate and I'm gonna work hard every single day to make sure we make St. Paul better. Thank you. Omar. Well, thank you. Um, well, I came here in, in St. Paul as immigrant and 25 years ago. And that, this city that welcomed me. And I am a parent and I have a children here in St. Paul. I am a small business. And uh, two, I have a two business in St. Paul. And uh, one thing that I want to see here in St. Paul is that affordable housing. And we have a homeless, um, we have evictions, um, we have uh, um, uh, crimes in, in here, we have a new business, we need a new business in St. Paul. I will be uh, um, your voice, listening to you every, um, every day and day and night, and to represent you City Hall. I represent to you as the Planning Commission City of St. Paul for four years. This is my fifth year. I am a, a vice chair of a zoning as the behalf of War One, and uh, I will be uh, and represent to you as a city council. And I am the only candidate that of city level experience in 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 in, in St. Paul in, in in War One, and I need your support. I need your vote. I will be in uh, a pilot this year, and we have a. Uh, um, uh, early voting going right now. I need your support. I need your vote. Suze. Well, thank you all who have stayed till the end. Um, it's really been really great to, to share my vision of the city with you. Um, just to, in a nutshell, I'd like to share my top three issues and hope that you, you know, will join me and make St. Paul more beautiful and more accessible. First of all, uh, there is a huge decrease in the number of uh, insects and native songbird species. It's causing environmental devastation already. Uh, I want to make more city property and help people with private property to transition it over to native plant species uh, and create, help create habitat for pollinators. I'd like to have a streets for all policy where whether you bike, take the bus or walk or use a wheelchair, you can get around. I used to work as a PCA, so I've seen secondhand what having a wheelchair can do in terms of your ability to get around. And then finally, I'd like to expand St. Paul District Energy to have a municipal energy option for St. Paul so that you could get 100% of your electricity from our city municipal energy and transition over to 100% renewable energy. Thank you. Jeff. Thank you. I love St. Paul. I, I didn't grow up here. I never had a hometown. We, my family moved around a bunch of times when I was a kid. So, you know, I, I moved here 20 years ago more or less by accident. I wasn't going to stay. I thought, St. Paul sucks. I, I wanna, I'm going to move back to Minneapolis. can't live here. Well, in the meantime, I found a real community, a place where little kids draw on the sidewalks with sidewalk chalk and ride their bikes around, a place where our neighbors, some of them have lived in their houses for 50 years. I, I don't think you find that many places. But we have a community with community gardens. You can garden in a community garden. Not, not many places have things like this. So my vision for St. Paul is, yeah, there's some, some things that need to change in St. Paul, but overall, St. Paul is a good place. So what I would like to see is keep St. Paul boring. Thank you. On behalf of all of our partners, the League of Women Voters want to thank our candidates and our audience, both in person and online, and online for attending today's forum. I have two dates to call out. The first is the NAACP of St. Paul is gonna be hosting a St. Paul School Board Forum October 5th, 6.30 p.m. right here at the Highly Q. Brown Community Center. The second, we are the League of Women Voters. When can you vote? It's November 7th or it's today. You can vote early as well. So on behalf of the League of Women Voters of St. Paul, thank you and good night.